Ya. Doktor Sadna Doktor Sadna we can't hear you. So we are live on YouTube. Mr. Arun, I think we should start. It is 5 p.m. Yes, yes. Uh, we are we are live on YouTube, and uh, I would like to thanks each and every one of you to accept this invitation and joining this uh, webinar on intrapartum management revisit, which is a very important topic and very crucial. A lot of lot of maternal mortality, new mortality happening during this phase, and uh, we all needs to somehow prevent those lives. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Alpesh, Dr. Sadna, Dr. Sanjay, Dr. Anju, Dr. Rajesh, Dr. Shipra, and Dr. Mukta. So, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Sadna, who will be taking the webinar end to end. And uh, I think she doesn't need any introduction, but I would be definitely doing the introduction. So, she is the proxy representative of SOFOZ. She is a ICOG uh, governing council member. She is vice president of Foxy. And many more. Dr. Sadna, I'm also handing over to you. And uh, you know, it, you you should be moderating this whole session. And uh, I would be handing. <laughs> okay. So thank no, you, Mr. Arun. Uh, first of all, uh, we welcome all the speakers, especially our Foxy president, Dr. Alpesh Gandhi. <laughs> who has been kind enough to be here despite a very, very, very busy schedule and is all like engrossed in the 1st July organ donation day, Doctors' Day celebration. So we are highly thankful to Dr. Alpesh to be here. And why I think why he is given the time because he has been always passionate about the obstetrical care. And Dr. Alpesh Gandhi, uh, we will start with the keynote address of Dr. Alpesh Gandhi and I wish to tell every audience who has joined in a large number and seen this session in the live queue. We are having this session on the intrapartum care we visit because everybody knows that the major maternal and the neonatal morbidity and mortality in the of labor care and just immediate after the delivery. And this is the time in COVID time, like we are having this sort of meeting. This is the time to revisit our obstetrical care because in developing country, we are having unacceptable maternal criticality as well as mortality rate. And not only the maternal, but also the neonatal mortality as well as high incidence of cerebral palsy following birth asphyxia. So in the whole session, I will address to all audience to be with us whole this one and a half hour because we will be covering new aspect of the intrapartum care and how technology can actually be utilized for the major public health issues. So first of all, Dr. Alpesh Gandhi is with us, who is Foxy President 2020. And we all have been seeing his huge activity despite the COVID lockdown. Actually, we have opened so many windows in this year and uh, Dr. Alpesh Gandhi has that perseverance and the vision to go through all the difficulties. So he has been the past vice president of Foxy, past practical obstacle committee of Foxy chairperson with recipient of best Foxy award. He has been real, uh, he is a uh, fellow of the Royal College of Obi Gaini. And the most important thing with this that he has brought, Dr. Alpesh Gandhi has brought the concept of critical care in obstetrics to whole of the country, including us. 
we have actually now see the the critical highly dependent unit in obstetrics and the intensive care unit in obstetrics is how important and he has been instrumental not only to professional bodies but also the government institution and government of india so we welcome dr alpesh gandhi and uh, he will in his keynote address he will like share his vision and what he foresee in the intrapartum care in the next few years so uh, welcome dr alpesh gandhi uh, we again heartily welcome you and the stage is all yours thank you dr sadhna uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction for inviting me and i must congratulate for this very useful webinar uh, as you have mentioned this is a difficult time of uh, covid 19 pandemic and we all are uh, facing this uh, one of the biggest health crisis challenge but in spite of all in spite of all these challenges i must congratulate all the viewers and all the faculties for continuing essential medical health services particularly maternity health services and as per the oxford university surveillance or monitoring means close observation especially when something is uh, suspected or very precious or uh, important so surveillance during intrapartum period is as dr sadhna has mentioned very very important not only for mother or only for the fetus but both mother as well as both fetus and not only for the mortality also to prevent long term short term morbidity so it is it is said in some of the studies it is mentioned that a 48% of the mortality occurs during labor or immediately before labor or immediately after labor so this is a very crucial period and intrapartum monitoring is very very essential to decrease the maternal mortality care uh, mortality rate and neonatal mortality rate the suitable methods available should be used and adapted in all the pregnancies with or without risk in order to avoid adverse outcome so actually all the pregnancies are very precious and we need to monitor all the pregnancies during intrapartum period carefully anurag prakash ray declared that i can go days without taking without talking to you i can go days months without seeing you but not a second goes by that i am not thinking about you so this is very true for this intrapartum period continuously during the period we are thinking for mother and the fetus and for the best possible outcome i hope this webinar aims to cover all the relevant topics during intrapartum period intrapartum surveillance intrapartum monitoring intrapartum monitoring for both mother as well as fetus i am happy to see that the topics are going to be discussed covered by eminent clinicians and once again i must congratulate dr sanjay das practical obstetric committee chairperson and dr sadhna gupta for this wonderful job i wish all of you a great learning happy learning a smooth practice safe practice and happy safe motherhood to all the mothers to whom you are taking care once again 
Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. First July is the Doctor's Day. In advance, I would like to wish all of you a happy Doctor's Day. Thank you. Oxy, Oxy has planned a very unique program to celebrate the Doctor's Day this year. We have organized a e conclave from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. 5:30 p.m. And the topic is our aim is to sensitize <coughs> organ donation. We want to spread awareness about organ donation. We want to remove many myths regarding organ donations. And we also want to launch organ donation pledge drive. And if we would be able to get good support from all of you, then even we may claim for uh, Indian Book of Record or organ donation pledge drive. And at present, within a day, 24 hours, we have received many, many pledges. And this program is not only for the Foxians, this is for our all the family members, relatives, friends, Pharma, uh, uh, pharma companies, common people, everybody. So anybody can take pledge, anybody can associate, and anybody can, anybody can attend this e-conclave. Unique topics are there. We have tried to cover from eye donation, blood donation, organ donation, myths regarding donation. And one good thing is, the national body, which is known as NOTO, who is controlling about this organ donation, and ROTO, which is the regional body, has appreciated us, and they shown willingness to join as the partner, and they also allow us to use their logo. So they authenticated Fox's initiation, and Dr. Harsh Vardhan, Honorable Minister of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India is going to inaugurate and blaze the e-conclave at 2.15 p.m. So I wish all of you, please join in large number. We are expecting more than 20,000 viewers. So please join in large number and please forward the message, the flyer, and the details to all your friends and in other groups. Once again, I wish all of you a happy learning with this. I would like to hand over mic to Dr. Sadhna Gupta. Thank you, Dr. Alpeshandi. We have really uh, introspected as well as seen outwards in your presidential year and we really look forward to see many many innovations. this year will be memorable for many things and uh, uh, it will be a symbol that how foxy stood erect active and alert during this difficult time so thank you very much and coming again to intrapartum care this whole symposium and uh, first topic is will will be covered by Dr. Rajesh Kumari and she will cover the importance of partogram. Now partogram is a thing which is actually always sources, it always pricks us because we know it is a single paper partogram requiring no investment, no cost, but it is not being used not only in India but all over the world to that much of capacity that it should be used. So there are many, many things about partogram. It is a very, very good learning in Maneta program. We have uh, like seen that a simple training actually uh, opens up the mind of people, paramedicals to use of partogram and they know how to learn. So Dr. Rajesh Kumari, who is uh, associate professor in Oxgyni, uh, mem in the Oxdaini, she has been membership and fellowship of many prestigious institutions. 
she has been awarded with best research paper in iuga and her area of interest is high risk pregnancy and urogynecology so dr rajesh kumari uh, please stage is all yours that uh, the importance of partogram in intrapartum care uh, good evening everyone and thank you sadhna ma'am alpesh sir and arun for this uh, webinar uh now without wasting time i would like to start my uh, presentation on partograph okay uh, arun are you uh, uh, sharing my slides no you can share you can share you slide share because uh, my laptop is not allowing me yeah. host disable participant screen sharing this is same host disable participant screen sharing there is problem something if there is any problem then arun you can share the screen and uh, arun please the slide you please share her slides uh. so that she can do Yes, yes. Yes, yes. So, a uh, partograph is usually a pre-printed paper from. Can you see? Yeah, I can see, but okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, it is a usually pre-printed paper or form on which labor observations are recorded and. aim of this partograph is to provide a pictorial overview of labor and to all midwives and obstetrician to deviation in maternal and fetal well being and labor progress so it is a composite graphical record of key data maternal and fetal during labor entered against time on a single sheet of paper this is a basic uh, definition of partograph so on partograph why this is important because observation on both the mother and the fetus condition according to the predefined expected progression are made on this single paper so when uh, we are uh, talking about partograph there are uh many many versions of partograph like this fedbin partograph which was presented in 1954 this was a graphical analysis of labor including cervical dilation mostly based on rectal examination were recorded in centimeters per hour which formed a curve that be became known as cervicograph or also as a fedbin curve and according to the pattern of this cervicograph the labor is divided in four phases of cervical dilation 1 2 3 and 4 one is latent phase that is characterized by softening and effacement of cervix and with slow uh, di uh, dilation in linear fashion until approximately 2.5 cm dilation is reached and second is denoted as acceleration period or acceleration phase and is marked by a rapid change in the slope of curve with continuing increase in dilation third is phase of maximum slope and fourth is deceleration phase begin when cervix is fully dilated and is characterized by a change in slope like phase 2 and the progress again slows this is a fedbin curve so again in 1972 philpot and castle shows like alert line and action line now what is alert line alert line is to identify slow progress of labor and enable transfer of slow progressing women to the hospital where active management could be offered within 4 hours of crossing the alert line this is very important for uh, midwives to follow this the alert line expecting a cervical dilatation of 1 cm per hour is a modification of the mean rate of cervical dilation in the slowest 10% of the included women in philpot's study now what is action line it is 
line to allow active management of labor to avoid unnecessary cesarean section and this line is parallel and 4 hours to the right of alert line so now we will uh, talk about who partograph there are uh, many variations of who partograph and it is modified time to time uh, and many times so uh, who has published three types of partograph one is composite partograph in 1994 include a latent phase of 8 hours and an active phase starting at 3 cm cervical dilation it has an alert line with a slope of 1 cm per hour which commences at 3 cm dilation and an action line is 4 hours to the right of and parallel to the alert line and it also provides space for recording descent of fetal head indicator of maternal and fetal well being and medication what we are going to administer this is a who partograph in which we have name of patient pa gravida parity hospital registration date of admission time of admission what is the time of rupture membrane and how many hours are going on Uh, fetal heart rate recording, cervical dilation and cervical uh, descent is also recording. This is alert line and action line and contraction and maternal uh, uh, parameters are also recorded in this partograph. So, second uh, partograph, which is modified partograph in two thousand, the latent phase was excluded in this partograph and active phase commences at four centimeter dilation. latent phase was as removed from this or excluded because the interventions are more likely if uh, latent phase is included and because staff reported difficulties in transferring from latent to active phase the reason for for excluding the latent phase was more likely hood of interventions due to prolonged latent phase which was over diagnosed this was a basically picture of partograph in which there is latent phases avoided so according to this study by barbara the modified who partograph do we need a latent phase shows that labor can be managed without the latent phase being plotted on a partograph provided that a labor management protocol for the latent phase is instituted with clear guidelines so we can avoid this latent phase on our partograph so third partograph is a simplified version of partograph in 2006 this is further modified the partograph for third time and this time for use by skill attendant in health center that is very important like our pscs and cscs it is color coded and the area in between the alert and action line is colored amber indicating the need for greater vigilance cervical dilation not descent of the head is recorded on the partograph which is a part of labor record and other indications of maternal and fetal well beings are also recorded elsewhere in the labor record according to this who 2006 so this is basically presentation of uh, modified or simplified partograph uh, that is presented in uh, 2006 uh this is a little bit about labor scale which is modified version of who partograph which uh, this is we are not using but this is presented by a who and in that the alert and action lines are replaced by a scale of cervical dilation it is shown to minimize the diagnosis of labor dystocia without increasing the risk of without increasing the risk of fetal distress and so this is one study which is presented in american journal of perinatology in 2018 this is slip trial according to this slip trial labor monitoring with the labor scale is associated with lower rate of cesarean section and less and shorter use of oxytocin for augmentation of labor and monitoring of labor progress start at 5 cm or more is also associated with lower rate of cesarean delivery this is according to slip trial now a uh, little bit about what is e partograph that is electronic version of partograph and is a state of art application that could be assessed through a smartphone or tablet pc or computer device and uh, the user have to concentrate only on a single portion of the partograph one at a time that lessens the existing complexity of a paper uh, single uh, paper based partograph 
and the application had option to save the data both in local storage and in remote central database storage concurrently and this application allow partograph data to be monitored remotely also so this is another study uh, research article that, that is uh, by amnur rehman and uh, this is feasibility and effectiveness of electronic versus paper partograph on improving birth outcomes this is a prospective crossover study design and according to this the partograph user rate has significantly improved with e partograph and was associated with an overall reduction in cesarean birth and use of e partograph was also associated with reduced rate of prolonged labor also so paperless partograph is a simple graphless non time consuming method which only involves the calculation of expected time of delivery and it identify slow progress of labor and the time to intervene and terminate labor or to transfer a woman to higher center with facility to uh, cesarean section it has two components uh, one is alert line that is estimated time of delivery and another is ex uh, action uh, estimated time of delivery the alert calculation used the principle that cervix dilates 1 cm per hour when woman is in active stage so the birth attendant simply adds 6 hour to the time at which woman become 4 cm dilated and this way alert estimated time uh, of delivery is calculated and to calculate action uh, estimated time of delivery 4 hour is to added to the alert estimated time of delivery and both timings are written on the patient's indoor paper and the action uh, estimated delivery is circled in the red and at the time of alert uh, etd if the patient has not delivered and the current setups lack the operating facility like at psc or sometime at csc also if there is if there is no facility of blood bank anesthesia problem and there is another problem then the arrangement for the transportation or should be made and at that time action etd the woman is at the risk of prolonged labor so immediate action must be taken to deliver her promptly this is another study by gitanjali deka and this is published in international journal of reproduction contraception ops and gyne in 2016 according to this study the paperless partograph is found to be as effective as who partograph in effective management of labor and it is use uh, more user friendly has and has promising prospect of replace the who partograph also this is another study by uh, abir a mohammad effect of using the paperless partograph versus the original partograph on labor outcome in women health hospital and in this study the paperless partograph refer to mon uh, monitoring progress of labor and arriving at an accurate decision for intervention to ensure safe delivery and it needs no graph paper and no extra time to do it so conclusion was now we are discussing little bit about the components of partograph like personal information of the patient we have already discussed uh, name parit gravida parity registration number date of admission time of admission and time of rupture membrane uh, these are important for and also about fetal well being like fetal heart rate and uh, uh, character of like a amniotic fluid is observed if it is clear then c blood stain then b and if meconium stain then m and if membrane is not ruptured then we will write i for intact membrane uh then we will indicate molding and molding is an important indication of the pressure exerted on the head by the pelvis in labor and uh, uh we are uh, writing zero bones when bones are separated and the sutures are can be felt easily plus when bones are just touching each other two plus when bones are overlapping but can be separated easily with pressure from your finger which may mean the woman should be referred to a higher level of care three plus bones are overlapping but cannot be separated easily with pressure from your fingers which may mean the woman should be referred to higher level of care this is a uh, regarding uh, fetal heart rate and labor uh, liquor and monitoring molding of uh, head so third stay uh, third part of this partograph is uh, labor progress dilation cervical dilation is assessed to every vaginal examination in mark with a cross sign and plotting begins on partograph at 4 to 6 cm dilation because nowadays we are doing at 6 cm in our institute 
Descent assessed by abdominal palpation refer to the part of head divided into five part palpable above the symphysis pubis. Then the descent is recorded as a circle at every vaginal examination. And uterine contractions are recorded every 30 minutes, palpate the number of contraction in 10 minutes and their duration in the seconds. Now, on partograph, the alert line starts at 4 cm of cervical dilation and to the point of expected full dilation at the rate of 1 cm per hour. And action line is parallel and 4 hours to the right of the alert line that is shown in the, is this picture. So, dilation. The latent phase is from 0 to 4 dilation and is accompanied by gradual shortening and thinning of the cervix and it should normally not last more than 8 hours. And active phase is 4 to 10 centimeter dilation and it should be at the rate of uh, at least 1 centimeter per hour. And when labor progresses well, dilation of cervix should remain on or to the left of the alert line. And when admission takes place in the active phase, cervical dilation is recorded on the alert line. And this is uh, about uh, plot uh, uh, regarding uh, cervical dilatation and cervical uh, descent of head on this partograph. So descent, uh, uh, how to monitor descent or by per abdomen examination? This is by a fifth method. The width of five finger is a guide to expression in the fifth of the head above the brim. And the head which is mobile above the brim will accommodate the full width of the five finger. As the head descend, the portion of the head remaining above the brim will be represented by the few fingers. Uh, as we are doing uh, in our old days and uh, I am also used to doing this uh, fifth method in, uh, for descent of labor nowadays also. This is a uh, fifth method for uh, uh, descent of head by palpating. And this is also pelvic brim and descent of head. In uh, at five fifth, five five, five public five, there is uh, sincipit and occipit is completely about, and in four fifth, sincipit is high and occipit is easily felt according to this, and zero fifth, no, none of the head is palpable. So, uterine contraction contractions are observed for frequency and duration and recorded in the photograph at every 30 minutes, and the number of contraction in 10 minutes is recorded. We are recording like a dots and lines and uh, black color, uh, solid color. So dots remain mild contraction and lines, diagonal lines indicate moderate contraction and solid color represent strong contraction for longer period. Another other things are medications, drugs, IV fluid that will be recorded in a space provided. Now, uh, on maternal well-being, blood pressure, pulse, temperature should be recorded in every 30 minutes and blood pressure every 4 hours and temperature every 2 hours. And in urine, albumin, glucose, acetone and urine output is also recorded and the amount is recorded every time urine is passed. And then woman is also encouraged to pass urine in every 2 hours in labor and each specimen is tested for the protein and ketones. This is maternal record on partograph. And this is a partograph in which everything is showing with contractions to alert line and uh, there is normal progression of labor and uh, also maternal parameter and fetal heart rate. So if using the partograph with the latent phase, cervical dilation when plotted the, will cross to the right of the alert line after eight hours and the woman will, should be referred to the center. In the active phase of labor, plotted of the cervical dilatation will remove, uh, normally remain on on to the left of the alert line. When the dilation move to the right of the alert line, a full assessment of the mother, fetus and progress in labor must be made. And rehydration, emptying the bladder and encouraging the woman to be more active and move around or adopt an upright position will speed up the progress of labor also. However, if there is any other complication like fetal distress, hypertension, failure of head to descend, the mother must be referred immediately for expert help unless the birth is imminent. And it requires transfer to the another facility, arrangement for transportation should be made. And when cervical dilation crosses the action line, action must be taken immediately 
at the action line the movement must be referred without delay to a higher level health facility so advantages of partograph the partograph provides a pictorial presentation of labor and gives a good overview of labor progression accessible for most health care worker in paper or electronic version usefulness during handover and at shift changes and this promote continuity of the care whenever they are in labor room we are always doing 12 hour or 6 hour duties and uh, nurses are also doing 6 hour duties so there is every time there is shifting there is change in the shift and we can easily uh, uh, show them the progress of labor on this is on a single paper tool for teaching student about pro labor progress and prevention of prolonged labor and observation and recording of fetal maternal condition more objectively and there is early intervention can be done and complications such as prolonged labor can be avoided and reduce in uh, incidence of cesarean rate so is partograph really needed according to cochrane review which explored the use of partograph for laboring women at term had two objectives the first was to assess whether partograph was improved outcomes and second was to assess which partograph design was preferred and this review found 11 studies which met the inclusion criteria three which compared partograph with no partograph and eight comparing different design and finding from cochrane review were un inconclusive raising doubt regarding whether the partograph should be used as a part of routine care now it also had insufficient evidence to suggest which design is the most effective if it is to be used so competent use of partograph especially using newer technology can save maternal and fetal lives by ensuring that labor is closely monitored and the life threatening complications such as obstetrical labor are identified and treated this is another study by benajir ahmed uh, about partograph versus no partograph effect on labor progress and delivery outcome a comparative study and and uh, this is published in 2007 the conclusion of study was the use of partograph when compared to no partograph plotting in active labor is associated with better monitoring of labor progress as well as delivery outcome in the form of a healthy mother and a healthy child so what are the challenges for implementation several factor are have been implicated to the cause of this low use such lack of awareness and proper training that is most important low availability of partograph negative perception of the partograph high patient load inadequate staff at the facility lack of supervision and negative attitude that is most important sometimes our sisters are saying why we are using this partograph we will not fill this but we have to repeatedly tell them and we have to repeatedly uh um, telling uh awareing them ki this is important paper we are never your shift is changing you can use this on single paper for a taking over of the patients so this is little bit difficult to telling them or uh, teaching them to reuse this partograph so this is another uh, study which is published in reproductive health completion of modified uh, world health organization partograph during labor public health institution of addis ababa ethiopia so conclusion of this study was finding may reflect poor management of labor or simply inappropriate completion of the instrument and indicate the need for pre service and periodic on job training of health worker on the proper completion of the partograph and regular supportive supervision provision of guideline and mandatory health facility policies are also needed in support of collaborative effort to reduce maternal and perinatal deaths so yet despite decades of training and interventions implementation rates and capacity to correctly use the partograph remain low in resource limiting setting the greatest challenge in using partograph is to enhance its effectiveness implementation in the management of labors universally but there is lack of commitment and inconsistent acceptability for the uses of partograph in labor room thank you uh, thank you very much uh, dr rajesh you have thank you ma'am 
a very clear and concise concept of partogram and uh, as we know that uh, right from the paperless partogram and i wish to communicate to all audience that our own uh, dr alok devdas has actually conceptualized the paperless partogram uh, which he was not mentioned i hope i have requested him to be with us and he has registered also and actually as you say that in very very resource poor setting any paramedics can calculate four six hours to be for the expected time of delivery and four hours and more and this is the time to refer so uh, we have oh a big uh, like uh, gratitude to dr alok devdas for this concept of e uh, paperless partogram which has spread all over and the e partogram because the second thing that mobile is now with everyone with paramedics with every with dai with ayas and uh, i think in the end of the session mr arun will demonstrate that how we can use this mobile app for the constitution of partogram simple cervical dilatation if not much uh, i will request uh, dr sanjay das uh, chairperson technical obstetrical committee and uh, teaching he is in the professor in the teaching institution and i will like to have the comment expert comment on dr of dr sanjay das that how you find useful e partogram paperless partogram as well as the conventional partogram uh, in your setup and as a your experience um, all over the country as per foxy experience so sanjay a brief comment from you before we switch on to the next speaker Um, unmute, un unmute, unmute. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Sadna, and um, thank you the presentation. And I most thank uh, Arun and the team, that is Sadna Gupta and her team and all the panelists, and especially to my dear president, who has narrated very well and uh, have a slogan and the organ donation and everything. As coming to the topic of partograph. the role of partograph in today day obstetrics uh, you can't forget you can neglect you can overlook the, it is badly necessary at and each point because we are concerned for the fetus above all okay so this partograph is being practiced at every point sometimes we overlook it sometimes we underestimate it sometimes we over diagnose it so be practical and be a thorough point in recording the partograph by the staff who is conducting and who is who is accompanying in the labor process it be a faculty it be a junior professor or it be a worker i mean to sister tutor and everybody who is working there it should be thoroughly vigilant and good interpretation is necessary to have to estimate some output so starting from partograph i way before dr devdas who has pioneered in this thing but paperless partograph and paper paper partograph and e partograph the basic came what the previous speaker has rightly pointed out the basic aim is of two things we want a good outcome and good interpretation and it should be in a proper use thanks thanks everybody i should not waste your time i one second thank everybody for joining with me thank you sir thank you thank sir you, uh, sanjay forest and um, we move on from the maternal progress on the overall partogram to the specific fetus which gives us signals that he is well or fit he or she is well or not well so the dr shipra kumari is with us who is working in the uh, medanta hospital uh in the lucknow and actually we are really privileged to have the galaxy of speakers who are working in the peak institution like aims delhi aims patna and the uh, kgmc and the government and the corporate sector which has emerged as one of the alternative way of the health uh, deliverance is including the obstetrical care so dr shipra is a uh, consultant in the medanta hospital ex professor and head iras lucknow medical college Uh, she has been many many 30 publication to the international and international journals and recipient of many award dr shipra will take us to the journey of the cardio topography which is very very important modality in intrapartum management so uh, over to dr shipra 
thank you so much ma'am for your kind introduction i hope i'm audible yes yes yeah ma'am a slight uh, correction i'm shipra kumar shipra <laughs> kumar <laughs> Uh, sorry, sorry, Tishi is Dr. Shipra Kumar. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for your kind introduction. I hope I'm audible. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, correction. I'm Shipra Kumar. Shipra <laughs> Kumar. Uh, sorry, sorry, Tishi is Dr. Shipra Kumar. <laughs> Okay, uh, so can you see my slides? Yes, yes. I am sharing my screen. audio i think it's uh, echoing uh, i can't hear anybody uh, should i share aapne aapko to on nahi kar rakha hai youtube ko aap band karke speaker link pe aaiye aur nahi ma'am speaker link par hi hai agar youtube hai to usko stop kariye aap because wo echo aa raha hai yes Okay, so slide slide is there. You can start. Slide is there. You can start. Okay. All right. Uh, so, a uh, very good evening to all uh, uh, participants, and uh, a big thank you to Sadhna Ma'am, Alpesh Gandhi Sir, um, and uh, of course uh, Arun uh, for having me here. I'm sorry I mentioned uh, Gandhi Sir later than uh, Sadhna Ma'am. but thank you thank you so much uh, everyone uh, for giving me this opportunity so without wasting any time i'll start uh, assessment of fetal well being so we all know since our undergraduate days we've been uh, uh, reading seeing i mean this is in and out of our lives cardio tocography is in and out so we can do it by intermittent auscultation we can do it by electronic fetal monitoring there was a time in our undergraduate days when we didn't have anything besides uh, our stethoscopes now we every hospital even small places may will be having a ctg machine and this everybody knows uh, this is ct machine a ctg machine is in every clinic And, and i'm sure arun will come up with something which will be in every clinics somehow some some day later so uh, you can see the ctg machine we have uh, it has an lcd panel where we can see the graph we can see even the contractions and it will display uh, uh, the fetal heart rate and the toco as well and uh, these buttons you can uh, see for the sound if you want the sound there when you want to start when you start printing the paper then there are transducers connected to it it's very important that we know uh, the the settings also for we start using the ctg machine so you know buttons you can uh, इलेक्ट्रॉनिक मॉनिटरिंग वॉज एन इनक्रीज इन you know every good thing which you start with there has to be a pitfall a backfall so there is of course there is a pitfall that yes cesarean section rate has increased with the use of electronic fetal monitoring but we should not neglect the fact that how many babies we have saved with the use of electronic fetal monitoring 
so uh, we should not uh, you know it's not compulsory to use in every uh, patient but you should use it in if you have any uh, patient with chorioamnionitis meconium if you've seen uh, hypertension is there preeclampsia if you using oxytocin confirmed delay in labor prolonged rupture of membranes is there or there's a fresh vaginal bleeding in labor i don't think uh, these uh, we are using it regularly in all patients nowadays but yes of course it's not required these are the basic indications in which we should use and uh, whenever we take out a, uh, uh, the ctg we should mention the name age time duration the paper speed and if you are using fetal scalp blood sampling and i am sure very few uh, places would shipra hello but yes because it's not required dr shipra i think indications in which we should use uh, i think and there uh, is whenever a... we take out a, uh, uh, the ctg we should mention the name age time duration think, uh, the paper speed and uh, if you are using fetal scalp blood sampling and i thought very few uh, hello I, i think there is a youtube have you opened a youtube uh, i have because there is a two sounds are coming we should mention the name age time duration the paper you stop the youtube you stop the youtube only share the speaker link and slide share don't don't open the youtube you you, you only share the and now share the slide arun you share the slide and you have log in with bot speaker link na yes ma'am ha ah, now slides are there so yes it's so slide share प्रेजेंस ऑफ फीटल ब्लड सैम्पलिंग now this is uh, dr c bravado concept i think we all should follow this whenever we have a checklist or whenever we have a programmed uh, we make ourselves program to do in uh, in point form anything then i think we go we don't miss out on things so it's kind of a checklist this mnemonic uh, dr c bravado so uh, if you see that dr is for defined the doctor stands for define the risk you have a patient with who has a severe iugr who is uh, who's preeclamptic uh, who so you need to know pre previous cesarean section so you have to have that in mind then if there are contractions present or absent if the patient does not have any contractions and still she is having any decelerations that's very very significant so the contractions are present or absent that needs to be taken into consideration then you check the baseline then the come to the rate then variability accelerations deceleration and then you mention the overall impression which you are getting so once you have followed this checklist i'm sure you know the chances of going wrong would be lesser so this is again the same thing you go around this circle and then over, given overall impression so these are the risks which could be there now the baseline we all know it's 120 to 160 nice says 110 by to 160 and it's fine with that 110 to 160 yes below 110 you need to be a little alert so 100 to 109 is non reassuring less than 100 it's abnormal 160 to 179 is non reassuring and more than 180 is abnormal so baseline where do you see the baseline so please uh, you know uh, some of us uh, initially the residents might just see a uh, an acceleration and they might say that uh, the, oh the baseline is going up it might be a big acceleration so 
so the general baseline we need to see uh, the uh, and not the accelerations noting it over a period of time that yes now the baseline is 130 in this and then what are the causes of bradycardia so anything below 110 we said is bradycardia it could be because of head compression it could be a congenital heart block it could be maternal hypothermia or even in severe pyelonephritis we get a bradycardia tachycardia maternal hyperthermia if there is fever any infection uh, maternal hypotension fetal comp compromise there are cardiac arrhythmias and if the mother has been given some atropine or you giving her sympathomimetic drugs terbutaline then tachycardia could be present now when we see for acceleration increase in the fetal heart rate of more than 15 beats per minute lasting for more than 15 seconds you know if we see accelerations we are a happy lot especially the obstetrician if they see a heart, yeah, acceleration hai, we are happy about that so this might not be the best example for an acceleration but yes we can see uh, it is uh, there uh, it is lasting for 15 uh, seconds more than 15 seconds and it is more than 15 beats per minute so you need to outline that ki ha isme acceleration hai now then we go on to the variability now uh, and what is a variability so you just see this so if you see the ctg here you see a jagged jaggedness of the baseline ek ek line nahi hai ek seedhi line nahi hai there is a jaggedness of the baseline and that is what is the what variability we are talking about so the variability will be between 5 to 25 beats so decreased variability is parasympathetic stimuli is uh, uh, is could be because of a uh, parasympathetic stimulation sorry and it could be in sleep hypoxia administration of many drugs and increased variability is a sign of sympathetic stimulation so when we see variability uh, hum, we now we have defined that it's 5 to 25 so if it is reduced less than five for less than 50 minutes, it is referred to as non-reassuring. So if it is minutes for variability minutes, so we should not start worrying, right? We should wait, wait for some time. So uh, less than five beats for less than 50 minutes. So it's just almost up to an R, that's what we are talking about. If variability is less than five beats for more than 50 minutes, then it is abnormal feature. And if the variability is more than 25 for less than 25 minutes, then it is a non-reassuring feature. If variability is more than 25 for more than 25 uh, minutes, then it's an abnormal feature. non-reassuring feature uh, just after these slides so we need to see uh, so we've seen the base uh, baseline so we are going by the doctor c bravado so now we come to the deceleration so that that's uh, the second last thing of the doctor c bravado so decelerations are an abrupt decrease in the baseline fetal heart rate of greater than 15 beats per minute for greater than 15 seconds. So that's the just opposite of the accelerations. Uh, there are a number of different type of decelerations, each with varying significance. So here you have early, late, variable, prolonged. And I'm, I really hope the AI which is coming will make us <laughs> our lives so much easier that uh, we don't need to learn all this after some time. So anyways, so the decelerations could be early, late, variable, prolonged. And these variable decelerations are again divided into different types, like there could be a shoulder pattern, there could be a saltatory pattern, a lambda pattern, and an overshoot pattern. So uh, though most of the guidelines, if we go through them, especially the NICE guideline, 
specifically says do not use the typical and atypical types used early variable and late uh, the uh, uh, the terms should be early variable and late these iterations so but you know it's a uh, you know we've been learning it and i think it's important that we also know what it is a typical and atypical uh, uh, deceleration uh, variable deceleration so if a typical variable deceleration would have shoulders so we don't have to worry about it so if you can look into the this slide here uh yeah you see these shoulders what we are talking about so let me come back okay so shoulders and atypical there's an overshoot that is one shoulder later then there is saltatory the lambda pattern the slow return to baseline that's a late component baseline returns to a lower level after decelerations and a biphasic or a w that is loss of variability during decelerations so what is an early deceleration early deceleration is a symmetrical gradual decrease and return to baseline associated with contraction so here you can see and our teachers i remember my teacher dr tamkin and uh, dr seema they all taught us so nicely it's the mirror image of uh, uh, the contraction so if a contraction is coming like this and you see here the deceleration is a mirror image of the contraction that's an early deceleration so you don't need to worry much about these things and so you can see it is may, may be physiological in active labor and not associated with tachycardia or loss of variability or other fetal well being changes so you wait when there is an early deceleration don't worry too much about an early decelerations and the pathophysiology is head compression causes vagal nerve stimulation and leads to deceleration and uh, it is not associated with fetal hypoxia acidemia or low fkr scores but you should worry about a late deceleration late deceleration is the one which is to be worried about now this is the one which we need to really worry so because once the contraction you see the peak with the peak of contraction the dip is starting and when the dip is ended the uh, the contraction has ended the dip or the fetal heart rate dip is at its nadir you know it's the deepest there and then slowly it's going to pick up now this is a deceleration so it is a smooth gradual symmetrical decrease in fetal heart rate beginning at or after the contraction peak and returning to baseline only after contraction has ended and it is not accompanied by acceleration could could be maternal hypoxia maternal hypotension excessive uterine activity placental dysfunction uh right so uh, so we go to uh, so if so according to the nice classification classification the late deceleration for less than 30 minutes is non reassuring feature however if more than 30 minutes it is an abnormal feature so if these decelerations are coming and they are for last you know they've been there for less than 30 minutes it's it's non reassuring and if it's more than 30 minutes in abnormal feature variable decelerations abrupt decrease in fetal heart rate now these variable decelerations are not related to contractions they will just come and go no relation to contraction so this is uh, i'll just skip that so you can have different types of variable decelerations which we were talking about so here this is a typical deceleration with shoulders here this is the one with an overshoot you can see that the fetal heart rate is you know there's a dip and then it's coming back 
then there is loss of shouldering here this is pathological then smoothening at trough again this is pathological there's a late recovery so the fetal heart rate has dipped and the recovery is taking a lot of time so that's a late recovery again uh, we should be very wary and that's the w pattern so have a look at your variable decelerations closely now this is a saltatory pattern you know rapidly recurring couplets of accelerations and decelerations causing relatively large oscillations of the baseline of the fetal heart rate so this again is not a very good sign uh, 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 of in in labor then you get a lambda pattern also an acceleration followed by a variable deceleration with no acceleration at the end of the deceleration it could be because of a mild cord compression or stretch again we've talked about the overshoot we've seen that here here in this ctg we can see the overshoot so mm, nice classification for the nice classification the variable deceleration if without concerning characteristics the concerning characteristics like if uh, we've lost the variability also there are some other changes in the ctg if it is lasting for less than 60 seconds for more than 90 minutes is non reassuring if con if concerning characteristics present and variable deceleration seen in less than 50% contractions occur for less than 30 minutes it's non reassuring and if concerning characteristics present and associated with more than 50% contractions so you will see ki uh, with with 50 uh, with uh, how many contractions there are concerning characteristics and how many variable decelerations are there so a little confusing but you read it again and again and then only you get it so overall impression it could be a normal or suspicious or a pathological so this is by the nice guideline 2017 we can have it like uh, cat 1 cat 2 cat 3 that is category 1 category 2 category 3 by the acog classification i think it's almost the same uh, not much difference uh, but i have always read this so it's like uh, more easier for me to explain on this so if all the features are normal it's a normal ctg so now you're going to go to the o part of the dr c pravado and here you if everything is normal uh, it's a normal feature and uh, then if you have one wrong reassuring feature it is suspicious if it is uh, and pathological if there is one abnormal or two non reassuring features so we also have this uh, same is in the figo guidelines uh, and then we can divide on the basis we've seen the baseline we've seen the variability decelerations and then we decide whether it is normal suspicious or pathological it's again the same thing the difference between the fico the nice and the acog is not much as i said so management if you have a normal ctg we all know continue the same management you need not change anything it's usual care but if you have a suspicious ctg one non reassuring feature and two reassuring features you the management is correct any underlying causes such as hypotension or uterine hyperstimulation perform a foot set of maternal observations that is you check the vitals patient ko ke vitals mein koi problem to nahi hai pv kar le koi cord compression to nahi hai kahi cord to niche nahi aa raha hai perform a full set of maternal observations start one or more conservative measures inform your senior document a plan for reviewing the whole clinical picture and the ctg finding talk to you know that that's the nice guideline uh yahan pe to koi samjhega nahi but still you can always tell the woman we have something there we just looking into it 
then uh, pathological ctg one abnormal feature and two non reassuring features so again you inform your senior and exclude acute events for example cord prolapse suspected placental abruption suspected uterine rupture correct any underlying causes hypotension to hyperstimulation start one or two corrective measures you know and start talking i think i'll start talking uh, rather i'll start shifting the patient for cesarean so yes that's how we do they talk first and but here we we'll, i think pathological ctg uh, cesarean would be much safe safer because most of us would not have a fetal scalp blood sampling and uh, i think one most of our seniors also don't think that scalp blood uh, sampling is of any use as such anyways going on to the con conservative method uh conservative methods now you have a, a, you know non reassuring you with a suspicious ctg so what do you do so you give you know nice guideline does not promote giving oxygen there is simply they say don't oxygen has no role but acog does say ki ha oxygen laga do changing the mother's position yes treating the maternal hypotension uh, discontinuing labor stimulation oxytocin should be stopped and uh, acog does not talk about tocolytics but nice does say yes you can give some tocolytics if there is hyper stimulation you change the maternal position and you will get a lot of change in your fetal heart rate so there here this diagram you can clearly see how the aortic compression is occurring the blood supply is stopped so just change the position and that is why our teachers always stressed on left lateral left lateral left lateral so to change to the left lateral then maternal hydration is important overload should be avoided 5% and 10% are potentially dangerous and should be avoided and this is how you start this is a mnemonic for intrauterine resuscitation you stop uh, the so the mnemonic is spoiled stop oxytocin position the patient left lateral oxygen laga do iv fluid de do bp low hai vasopressors if you require she is rupturing or anything then tocolytics uh, that is plus minus nice says if there is hyperstimulation give her tocolysis need for urgent intervention is required when there is a placental abruption you know this is a dying fetus acute bradycardia a prolonged deceleration lasting for more than 3 minutes and remember the rule of 3 for fetal bradycardia in 3 minutes you should call for help 6 minutes she should be in theater 9 minutes pre uh, prepare for assisted delivery like if you are planning she is just delivering and 12 minutes is the time you aim to deliver the baby so if you have that kind of care you should uh, you know keep talking as the nice says even in a pathological ctg otherwise uh, as soon as you see a pathological ctg rush her into the ot and uh, the ph of the fetus should has been shown to drop at a rate of 0.01 every 2 to 3 minutes so the scalp blood you know i always i mean i have not used it i don't uh, know how many people in india are using it uh, but i'm sure uh, this must be helpful i did go to uk and they were using it and they added on uh, not only ph but also lactate levels to it to make the interpretation better and um, and I, i mean that is the protocol they use it but maybe in india it will take a long time for it to come now the stand is also coming up uh, and uh, probably in some few i don't know i just think that a shipra i will like to finish in two or three minutes because i think yeah, that's my last done. slide and yes, i'm done yes. so the key message is being methodical and reporting all important aspects in ctg is essential early reporting as trace changes and uh, remember doctor and the spoilt the patient you know 
and you'll get a happy baby when you are methodical thank you so much uh, thank you dr shipra it was wonderful dr c brevado good menomics i remember in the anatomy days we had so much and it is a very good thing and like you say deceleration mirror image of the contraction that's a very good message to the audience and uh, rightly we will discuss in the parallel situation that you say that it is the part of our practice but actual interpretation and actual action yes. uh, it is the real test of a experience and the overall review and i think in the panel we will clear this view uh, i uh, you said something about scale ph and the stent to the best of my knowledge in western world even they are a big big question mark on all fetal pulse oximetry fetal scale ph as well as the stent so i think there is nothing uh, what i have found and i will share with the sanjay that the indian obstetrician and an indian clinician find what they choose it actually persists and many things theoretical goes away we don't want invasive like internal monitoring western world has also dropped it internal fetal monitoring so i think there is a question of practicability when we have so much of lot one comment from sanjay for this before we go to the another very important topic that is the cesarean section auditing on roxen criteria so one comment on sanjay on this a uh, very important topic on the ctg uh, please unmute yourself and a brief comment before we go to the next speaker thank you sipra for your lucid presentation hello thank yeah. you yes we yeah. can hear you thank you is a fantastic presentation and rightly sadhana has pointed out that no gazet will help you unless you expertise in that field you have to expertise on the gazets as well as your clinical experience your clinical experience is definitely weighs more than any gadgets you display True. once you are thorough your clinical examination and added to it your gadgets it will help immensely go ahead thank you so thank you sanjay and uh, we are uh, we welcome our next speaker uh, professor anju agrawal who is professor in the king george medical university lucknow Hundred more than hundred national and international papers, recipient of various awards, and the or key executive for many conferences. So, Dr. Anju Agrawal is going to speak on again very sore topic. Every the world and the media, especially, is pointing to obstetrician for high rise of cesarean section rate, which is actually not so considering the real statistics, but. we owe to our people that we audit our institution that where we are doing cesarean section is there any scope for improvision in the practice so dr anju agrawal she is going to speak on the robson's classification and i wish that all our audience who is practicing obstetrics must be versed of this classification and she will enlighten so dr anju agrawal the kind invitation uh, arun it is showing that uh, host has uh, stopped uh, sharing screen i will i will share the presentation you will share yeah yeah okay so please uh, remain in sync uh, with me sure sure and uh, at the outset i would like to congratulate arun and janitri for conceptualizing such a useful uh, webinar and uh, the topic i'll be covering today can i have my slides please yes wait uh, i'll just share yeah uh, yeah thank you so uh, i'll be covering the importance of robson's classification now why do we want to talk about robson's we have two important statements of who first uh, came as long back as 1985 when they said there is no justification for any region to have a cesarean rate higher than 10 to 15% which they reiterated in 2015 when the cesarean rates were rising and then they again said rates higher than 10% were not associated with reductions in rates of maternal and newborn mortality 
So these are very strong statements. When we look at the data in India, we find in the past decade, in the public institutions, the cesarean rate has gone up by more than 300%. And in the private institutions, it has gone up by more than 400%, which is a very big jump. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, we are doing a regular uh, cesarean audits in our institution using this uh, Robson's classification. And we found in our institution also almost a 50% cesarean rate. And maximum contribution we found was by the Robson's group five, which is a group of previous cesarean section. Now that is a very important group it is only when we bring down the primary cesarean rate that we can reduce the cesareans in the previous cesarean group. Next slide, please. So it has been seen that these rising cesarean rates are a major public health concern because they lead to potential maternal and perinatal risks. Now these hazards, they are in the present pregnancy, due to the surgical, due to the anesthetic complications possibly which may occur. For the baby, we all know that uh, chances of RDS are, and transient tachypnea of newborn are higher in women who are delivered by an elective cesarean and the babies who are not facing the stress of labor. But even more alarming are the long-term complications which we are facing. Uh, I think we have all seen the dramatic rise in the placenta accretors. In our country, when women are not coming for a repeat uh, antenatal care, in our institution, which is catering mainly a referral center, a tertiary care center, we are getting a lot of cases. Women after a cesarean are sitting at home because they don't want to have another cesarean. And they are coming once the scar has given way. So the mother's life is in danger and the baby obviously cannot be saved. Can we go back, uh, Arun, please? Uh, you have uh, moved forward. So to address these problems of uh, high cesarean rates, many people, including us, we are giving excuses that we are catering to a very uh, high risk population. So is it really so? For that, we need an objective method of looking at it, for which a classification is required to monitor and compare the cesarean rates at facility level in a standardized, reliable, consistent, and action-oriented manner. Next slide, please. And what should be the characteristics of this classification system? It is very important. It should be simple to use. Only then we can uh, make people use it all the time. If it is very complicated, no one will be using it. It should be clinically relevant that we can look at what are the problems which we need to address, how we can bring down the rates, and how many cesareans are truly justified and how many are not. It should be accountable, verifiable, that whatever we are presenting is a correct data, it should be replicable. Next slide, please. So Robson's criteria, to a large extent, it fulfills these criteria. It is basically a classification for all women who are delivering in a specific setting. And not only for the women who deliver by cesarean section. It is therefore a complete perinatal classification. Next slide. So WHO has proposed that Robson's classification should be uh, used as a global standard for assessing, monitoring, and comparing the cesarean rates within healthcare facilities over time and between facilities. Which brings us to the point that a cesarean audit is very important to be held in all facilities who are dealing with obstetric cases. Next slide, please. So what is the importance of Robson's? Why do we want to use Robson's? Because it helps us to identify and analyze 
groups of women who are contributing the most and the least to the overall cesarean rates. Like in our hospital, we found that the previous cesarean uh, cases are contributing the most to the cesarean rates. It helps us to compare the practice in these groups of women with other units. So if uh, other hospitals are doing, which we have compared in our paper, we can compare which group is contributing more in their facility, how they are bringing down the rates in the group in which uh, we are having uh, problems. It helps us to assess the effectiveness of strategies or interventions which are targeted at optimizing the use of cesarean section so that we have objective evidence that yes, we have been able to bring down the rate of cesarean in a particular group of women. It helps us to assess the quality of care and clinical management practices by analyzing outcomes by groups of women. It also helps us to assess the quality of data which is collected. So, uh, it is important that the data be routinely collected, be analyzed, and then it should be audited. Next slide, please. So what exactly is this Robson's classification, which is also known as the TGCS or the 10 group classification system. Next slide. So it is basically, as the term says, divided into 10 groups. Group one comprises nulliparous women with a singleton pregnancy, cephalic presentation, and equal to more than 37 weeks of gestation in spontaneous labor. So the things which are specified, the woman is nulliparous, singleton pregnancy, cephalic presentation, term pregnancy in spontaneous labor. Group two, again, is nulliparous, singleton, cephalic presentation, more than 37 weeks term pregnancy, but these women either had uh, induction of labor or were delivered by cesarean section before labor. So you see, we can classify all our uh, antenatal cases into these groups. Group three are multiparous women, but multiparous without a previous cesarean. Again, singleton, cephalic presentation, term gestation, spontaneous labor. Group four, uh, just go back to the previous slide, please. Group four, again, multiparous without previous cesarean, singleton, cephalic presentation, term gestation, but again, either labor was induced or they were delivered by cesarean section before labor. Group five, as I already mentioned, these are multiparous women with a previous cesarean section, singleton, cephalic presentation, term gestation, uh, which may be spontaneous labor, induced labor, or labor with a uh, cesarean without labor. Now that is part of the modified Robson's which we'll be discussing. Group six, all nulliparous women with a single breech pregnancy. So it is singleton, breech presentation. They may be term or preterm. They may be spontaneous. They may be induced. They may be cesarean before labor. <coughs> Group seven are all multiparous women with again singleton breech presentation and it includes women with previous cesarean section. Group eight are all cases with multiple pregnancy. There is no further division in this. They may be single, uh, they may be a cephalic presentation or any other, they may be term, they may be preterm. They may be having previous cesarean section, they may be nulliparous, they may be multiparous without previous cesarean. But any case with multiple pregnancy will be coming in group 8. Group 9 are all women with a singleton fetus with transverse or oblique lie. And again, 
they have not specified whether it should be preterm term all cases with transverse or oblique lie and a single tip fetus will be included in group 9 <coughs> group 10 are all women whether uh, nulliparous multiparous previous cesarean but with a single tip fetus cephalic presentation and less than 37 weeks gestation that is all preterm cases with a singleton cephalic presentation. Next slide, please. And this uh, Robson's was modified by SOGC in 2012. And as I have already mentioned, the different groups, they can be divided with uh, according to the onset of labor, which may be spontaneous, induction, or there may be cesarean before labor. Next slide, please. So you see that in uh, the Robson's classification, the obstetric variables which we require to complete the classification are very simple. We need to know the parity. We need to know whether the woman has a previous cesarean or not. We need to know the type of onset of labor, whether it is spontaneous or it is induced or she is undergoing cesarean without labor. That is an elective cesarean section. We need to know the number of fetuses. We need to know the gestational age and we need to know the fetal lie and presentation. Now these are the basic variables which are being recorded in all obstetric case sheets. So it is not as if to do the Robson's classification, we need to collect a lot of data or anything. And that is why it is a very simple classification. These are some of the common uh, questions which arise in the mind of people who are using Robson's for the first time. One is, should abortions be included in parity? But I think all obstetricians know abortions are not included. So even a woman with previous three abortions, if she has not had any uh, delivery that is beyond 20 weeks, she will be included as a nulliparis. Then another query which arises, face presentation, brow presentation. As we know, we are specifying the presentation and not the presenting part. So cephalic presentation includes vertex, face and brow, all of which will come in the cephalic presentation. Next slide, please. Another uh, common confusion is a woman who has presented with the breach, external cephalic version has been done and then she goes in spontaneous labor with a cephalic presentation. So when we are classifying her, we do not consider her to be breech. For the options, we will consider the presentation at the time of onset of labor or at the time of rather delivery. Whether we induce her, we do a cesarean before uh, labor, whatever we do, the presentation at that time. Then twin pregnancy with single fetal demise, it has to go in the multiple pregnancy group. But supposing there's a twin pregnancy where one fetus uh, vanishes in early pregnancy, that will be considered as a single tin pregnancy. So these are some of the common confusions which often present in the mind of our residents. So they need to be clarified. Next slide, please. Uh, WHO has given a standardized reporting format for which we need to report the group name and or number and the definition of that group. The total number of cesarean sections in each of these groups and we also need to note the total number of women delivered in each group because it is a complete uh, classification where we can classify all the women who are delivering at our facility. Then the relative group size to the overall facility population, that is the total deliveries and how many women in that group uh, were there. Then the cesarean section rate in each group, which will be uh, the numerator will be the cesarean section uh, cases undergoing cesarean in that group and the denominator will be the 
total women delivering in that group. Then the absolute group uh, contribution to the overall cesarean rate and the relative contribution to the overall cesarean rate. Next slide, please. So we need to interpret this data. Data has to be recorded. It has to be audited, which helps us to understand the type of population catered to by the hospital. And it helps us to judge the care which we are delivering. And then we can decide what are the possible changes. Like uh, for our institution, I said, we are getting a lot of previous cesarean cases. So though they are not a previous cesarean which are being done at our hospital, only a few of them are the ones who have undergone cesarean at our hospital. But we need to spread awareness to reduce the primary cesarean rates. Next slide, please. So to summarize, I think it is very important that we all uh, reduce the cesarean rates and it is important to classify the cases to be able to assess and compare data. Robson's is a very simple, practical and robust method of classification, but it will be useful only when it is used universally. So we need to popularize it. Just recommending it is not enough and that is why we need to make people aware that they need to follow their options, classify all the deliveries which are occurring at their uh, facility and present the data so that it can be collated on a national level. Thank you so much for a patient here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anjogavan. Uh, very nice talk and um, actually this is... Uh, if this Robson classification has to be included in our institution, whether it is a one-person obstetric unit or a peak institution, because it points not only to reduce cesarean or something, but it also points to the what level of care. Like if we are omitting cesarean section for transfers, like that shows also the uh, the suboptimal level of care. So thank you very much for the shortage of time. Now we will go a little fast and. Our next speaker is Dr. Mukta. Uh, he is, she is uh, working in the uh, as a professor, additional professor in All India Institute of Medical Science, Patna. Dr. Mukta Agrawal. Uh, she has been a, a brilliant student with 17 gold medals, with habit gold medal for best MBBS student and the best postgraduate student. Many publications to her credit, a good old friend. Uh, Dr. Mukta is going to talk on the role of artificial intel intelligence in monitoring of labor because this is the thing which COVID has actually pushed the artificial intelligence and all technology on the front. So Dr. Mukta, please en like enlighten all of us how the artificial intelligence can be used on our labor protocols. Dr. Mukta. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your nice introduction. Arunji, can we have slides, please? I will share the Can you see? Yeah, sure. So I will be talking about role of artificial intelligence in intrapartum management. Next slide, please. So in the beginning, it's uh, monitoring uh, health of the babies during intrapartum period is still remaining an unmet challenge for us as obstetrician. For this, our gadgets are performing intermittent FHR auscultation with a stethoscope or continuous CTG. Both are having equal results. And now artificial intelligent tools, they are just a beginning to transform these complex information in the CTG in routinely collected maternal fetal data into few algorithms. Next slide, please. So, in the recent years, we all could see an enormous rise in artificial intelligence use in the healthcare system. 
and uh, we are expecting expenditure on ai is going to be some 36 billion dollars by year 2025 ai requires training and it requires collaboration to become a success in healthcare a collaboration between engineer the scientist and the clinicians as we know third leading cause of death in us is medical errors and the incorporation of artificial intelligence in our practice can reduce them by improving improving accuracy in interpretation and decreasing the workload but ai can aid in decision making but it is not a substitute for our clinical experience and uh, what is ai ai actually is a combination of science and engineering on creating some intelligent computer system which are able to perform task as good as the humans or in other words these are the digital systems which parallel the way the human brain processes any information so the ai technology which are used in the healthcare mainly uh, we use machine learning which incorporate the uh, logistic regression and computational methods machine vision which is used in image and uh, video editing the natural language processing which process the human speech even it's a incoherent so this can process the speech and robotics next slide please for fhr monitoring we have electronic fetal monitoring which gives qualitative and quantitative overview of fetal heart rate as we have read today ctg in detail but there are frequent differences between specialist and this only arch for a system that decreases the error and unifies the interpretation of ctg next slide please this slide shows a ctg pattern next slide so what is the role of ai uh, artificial intelligence in fhr monitoring this artificial intelligent is used to monitor the fhr rate during labor via analyzing the ctg graph and estimating the possible outcomes it decreases the interpreting intrapartum it decreases the discrepancy in the interpretation of the uh, the monitoring and it provide the reliable and replicable that is decreases the inter observable and intra observer variation uh, variation for each analysis it provides the supporting evidence in cases of unpredictable poor outcome and it is especially important because it's a subjective thing so it's important uh, in cases which can potentially results in litigation because we have some substantial evidence with us next slide please next slide so how this artificial intelligence works in fetal heart rate monitoring so it uses two kinds of uh, artificial intelligence technologies that is machine learning and deep learning and the most important uh, variant of machine learning which is being used in uh, for heat fetal heart monitoring is ann that is artificial neuronal network it is a kind of technology where it works like the uh, bunch of a neuron as in the human brain to analyze the data so for ai to work in fetal heart monitoring we know the ex existing database so at present we are having two database worldwide that is one from the uh, check republic which includes 552 ctg recordings and another one from the university of koto which includes 2126 ctg recordings and with the help of this existing database software is being created which is used for fhr monitoring till date many softwares has been created like infan pericam and fetus and many mobile applications are created to provide support in the interpretation of ctg signals but this is still in the research phase and it's not going into clinical trials so all these trials they what they do they just uh, recruit the laboring patient who are eligible for continuous electronic fetal monitoring and these patients are randomized into control arm where ctg monitoring was done without any decision support and the intervention arm where ctg monitoring 
was done with decision support next slide please so how machine learning works machine learning has two kinds of machine learning one is supervised and one is unsupervised machine learning so mainly in fhr monitoring we use two modules one is this regression which is regression logistic analysis and clustering technique where they divide it into the groups next slide please so like this slide shows supervised learning like there is a test set which is existing database and a training set which is our uh, data rctg which we are going to uh, evaluate and they extract that uh, information and by using machine learning algorithm a predictive model is made and then output is being uh, given in the form of the classes like normal or abnormal or pathological next slide please so in the deep learning model they, there is data acquisition that is from database and the individual data and uh, by extracting these data the software interpret the result and taking into account the uncertainty reliability and rare outliers they interpret the learning and give us a result which is for optimal perinatal outcome so it's uh, from uh, a bit engineering side like performance of a machine learning algorithms there are many machine learning algorithms and they tested these for fetal heart monitoring and out of these machine learning algorithm artificial neuronal network found to be the most specific and most sensitive one so it is the most commonly used for the artificial uh, intelligence used in uh, fhr monitoring but uh, till now there is no evidence in any of the studies whether these systems really improve prediction of fetal distress as compared to ctg a recent uh, systemic review of all these studies were done in 2019 which concluded that use of machine learning for interpretation of ctg does not improve neonatal outcome and yet to prove its reliability relative to the expert observers next slide please so the first study uh, the uh, and software developed in this regard was the cafe that is the computer aided fetal evaluator studied and their objectivity objective of this study was to know the possibility of any ai system being able to interpret ctg data and they concluded that ai system read information at similar level as experts and it was also able to detect errors but their limitations was that when there is disagreement between the specialist while interpreting some data and it is mostly the interpretation of variability which lead to an inability to conclude that if the error in interpretation arose from a problem in the system or in obtaining agreement between experts in the field so this was the limitation next slide this is how the cafe system work next slide please another the famous one is the infant trial which was done in london uk and was published in 2017 and objective was to assess if computerized decision support system reliably identified abnormal fhr patterns and whether its use reduced the sta substandard care so and they conclude that significant proportion of abnormal fhr pattern uh, was uh, not uh, significantly less and it does not reduce the substandard care uh, incidence and this is the fetal technique that is four year evaluation of tracing and acidosis in liver they devised a mathematical tool which converts the time dependent waveform signal such as the fetal heart rate in ctg into the frequency and power spectrum signals so these specific frequency distribution pattern of fhr and they try to correlate the findings of fhr in the form of specific umbilical ph values of the newborn so from the ctg f pattern of fhr they were predicting the umbilical ph values of that particular case next slide please ai can uh, be used in the outpatient care as home monitors with telemedicine 
which can aid in earlier detection of complications especially in the high risk pregnancy these are the mobile electrode sort of things which a patient can wear and when uh, it provide warning signals to the patient with the dangerous fhr reading which can be communicated to the consultant via telemedicine it can prove beneficial in early detection of complications and decreasing maternal and infant morbidity it's not in clinical use it's uh, in a developmental research model next next slide please what are the advantages of artificial intelligence in intrapartum care artificial intelligence enable us to fast and accurate prediction of ctg and with a precision it decreases the inter and the intra observer variation which is the main limiting factor in interpreting any ctg by the use of artificial intelligence chances of human error could be minimized in a busy labor room since it's subjective and database so it reduces litigation arising due to fhr monitoring and objectively it helps to determine need for cesarean section uh, during intrapartum care next slide please every system has few disadvantages as well for ai it not only healthcare system but uh, with every use of ai there is a potential threat that ai could replace the need for manpower and the jobs could be cut off then as arts is the service area and there is a patient doctor relationship when computers will come in between the doctor and the patient there is a threat that we could lose that emotional bonding and that mutual trust and patient doctor relationship being a machine ai as well there is a possibility of machine breakdown or malfunction during any time so ai is not the substitute for our learning curve but it is for our assistance and a big disadvantage is the data theft we will be having big data patients uh, so the data can be stolen and can be used wrongly by the third party these are the things which should be th uh, taken care of there are many challenges when we will be using ai will be incorporating ai in our ctg patterns first will be the training training to ourselves and our patients as well then adopting a new technology is a difficult task we should get motivated and to adopt it and since there are many security issues then we should have some regulations regarding use of ai in healthcare system particularly in intrapartum monitoring and maintenance is a issue because machine breakdown will uh, wash away our system and the security reasons that data should not be stolen to conclude my talk i should say that artificial intelligence should be used as an assisting tool for doctors to make better decision and it should not overpower our medical decisions it should be used for faster and accurate diagnosis and it will it should be helpful to reduce the human error and the cost to emphasize computer cannot replace doctors and our training and this technology should empower us with precision to treat patients with utmost care and neglect and uh, decreasing negligence since it's will it will be subjective so we hope that it could help us in decreasing the litigations in case of any adverse neonatal outcome next slide please ai will be requiring multidisciplinary collaboration between the mathematician engineer scientist and the clinicians for creation of data sets and the softwares machines are susceptible to vulnerabilities and breakdowns problem of data threat but to conclude artificial intelligence has a bright future in healthcare it's in revolution and its benefit outweighs the potential challenges and fears which we all have in our minds next slide please to conclude i would like to quote stephen hawking who said ai is likely to be either the best or the worst thing which could happen to humanity i just hope it should be the best thing which could happen to us thank you so much thank you for your thank patience you, Mukta, it was excellent session you gave a very neutral very nice perspective and opened many many windows which many of us are not if aware it is like peeping into the future with all its dangers as well as the advantage so excellent uh, dr mukta i wish you really all the best 
and for Thank the sake of time, time uh, we will go straight away because you have all said the stage that how the computers or the artificial intelligence cannot replace human mind which has got the wisdom and intuition and gut feeling and what not which is the nature's like direction we are to go so we are straight away arun we are straight away going to panel we will reduce the time from 30 minutes to around 20 25 minutes so we request all our speakers and uh, panelists to be brief and we will straight away go to some tricky situation can i share my uh, slides arun sure 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 let me share and again uh, dr sanjay das has not been uh, introduced though he has spoken uh he is a uh, chairperson practical obstetrical committee joint director odisha health services joint secretary aogo that is obigani association of odisha uh, organizer key organizer of many conference and a uh, life member of many uh, associations so we are having sanjay as a expert panel and all the speakers will remain in the panel so please share my slide so Uh, it is cardio tachography analyze interpret and, and i think with the shifra and with the uh, mukta's talk it has already set the stage next uh, can i slide the uh, scroll the slide uh, arun myself so this is shakespeare who know that yes one day it will end but we don't know what will be the end we all know that we intrapartum care and intrapartum journey is the most difficult journey of human life next next so uh, we one thing which we want to communicate to all our audience that it is not hum log we are spending so much time on the triple marker double marker or so many things but in our country actually it is the birth asphyxia which is causing the major contribution to still birth and our women need a good intrapartum care a good focus subjective team work so this is very very important that genetics and the chromosomal disorder are not our priority our priority is to reduce the birth asphyxia following cerebral palsy and all nicu care so every mother and child should count in our profession next arun so where we are our infant mortality still birth rate is 39 per 1000 live birth and we have to be very very it is i like women's our women's right that they receive that good particular care which they are entitled so next slide please next next arun so ctg we all know now that we have to have the team work and as mukta has said and the shipra has also pointed that all over the world there is modest intra observer and inter observer variation in tracing interpretation so sometimes we do unnecessary cesarean section or we say unindicated and sometimes we really lose the baby or find the grossly hypoxic fetus next arun next slide please so these are different guidelines and actually these different guidelines actually point that there can be the different interpretation of a particular tracing next please next 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 slide so why there is recommendation we have to be very clear that all recommendation presume that we have human as well as the material infrastructure in our labor room so that's a big question mark in our country and a second point whatever we interpret whatever artificial intelligence we have or the ctg monitoring it should never be regarded as a substitute for good clinical observation or judgment or an excuse to leave mother unattended so as a developing country and catering to so many birds we owe really really big great responsibilities next slide please next so next it has been covered by shipra next slide please next 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 so we are straight away coming next please. this is one uh, yes so this is a one important slide that it is prolonged bradycardia shows acute distress sub acute distress when there is ph drop 0.01 every 2 to 3 minute it is showing the sub acute when there is a prolonged deceleration more than less than 80 long standing chronic hypoxia actually eludes us when we have not sudden bradycardia but we find a non reactive tracing and the shallow deceleration and the gradually developing hypoxia 
Arun, have you shown the my original slide or what we have the previously? Yes. Next, please. Next, next. So uh, in this presentation, I have taken, I have listened to Dr. Arul Kumaran, a wonderful interpreter of the CTG. How it is not the heart we are seeing. We are seeing the brain of actually fetus. So this is one of the important thing, and I have taken many tracing from Dr. Alok Devda's book. He has been a wonderful teacher, and when I again reviewed the book, I found that how thoughtfully he has like given insight to each and every tracing which is in his book. So I acknowledge both of these great teachers, who we because we need these teachers to be so we are wise enough to differentiate when to wait. when to change the course and when to act aggressively so with this next slide please so one question to all i think we will take one panel one question sanjay you please unmute yourself uh, sanjay you uh, are you uh, shipra i will say to shipra and then sanjay are you performing routine admission ctg or not you have found it useful or not uh, yes ma'am i think uh, routine ctg is very useful And admission CTG. Whenever the patient come, you do the admission CTG. Yes, ma'am. Sanjay, so what you are doing in your institution? Yes. No, no routinely no. we are not doing. It is not practically possible because then very sub centers and uh, CSCs even in the headquarters also it is not available. One thing, and uh, I think to my clinical expertise, it is not should should not be used routinely. It is should be used in indicated cases only. Otherwise, there is a much of fallacies and much of interpretation, and you may land in problem and the increasing season and rate and all these things. But definitely, it helps in tricky situations. It will guide you definitely where to stand and where to move. Okay. Leave so it to you. I think we see uh, actually the two things. Shipra is all for all admission CTG, and Sanjay is not for because of lack of infrastructure as well. and i think in many many one person obstetric unit maternity unit also they are doing admission ctg so they don't uh, like come into the sudden thing that uh, the why the fetus was there and next arun and like next arun next slide so uh, the studies actually uh, uh, for, like confirm the sanjay's views that actually the admission ctg has not resulted in overall reducing perinatal morbidity mortality or the cesarean section rate but for the sake of convenience and reducing litigation and not attending the patients in midnight the admission ctg gives a clue that sometimes you see oh and the time of admission it was not good and we can action so both arms are equally good and you should tailor the uh, practice as per your need but don't but to benefit the mother and child next slide please next uh, ramu so this is one of the admission ctg i say uh, dr anju is here or not so uh, this is admission ctg patient has come with a mild tenseness of the abdomen and a reduced fetal movement so mukta what you say to this ctg uh, this is okay it is around 130 fetal heart it is okay or it is a little Uh, problematical mukta what is your interpretation ma'am fetal heart uh, baseline fetal heart is uh, between 130 to 140 but the short term variability is little less and we could not see any acceleration in this part yeah so Good. for me it's an equivocal ctg it's uh, neither a non reactive and nor a reactive one So what will you? If you have such a CTG, what will you say to your resident doctor? What will you do for this patient? Ka? She has been admitted. You are seeing a little bit contraction as well in the monitoring. What do you wish to have further? You can have your uh, clinical attitude. You you have to go for see the records. What is the positive finding in favor? Whether it is having cord presentation, whether it is having oligodendrous, whether it is having PIH or something like that. Any risk factor, you have to trace it out. Then you correlate. So thank yes. you very much, Sanjay, for it. Actually, sometimes uh, 
uh, we in the night what I, i'm running like in the night at 12 noon patient has some she is mild pain you want to see the personally but you can see the tracing on whatsapp it is the artificial intelligence and you see this patient requires observation so next slide please arun next slide so as mukta says it is a baseline variability is less and there has been a two thing there has been the two aperture there is gaps this i kehte na chhod diya we are not feeling not having any tracing and that is important that the sister or the para the resident doctor has done well ki ye to nahi ki there has been loss of contact or sometimes a cord around the neck with the compression we sometimes get the that loss of gap so like sanjay says we have to see whether this patient is already having iugr or oligohydromnios in ultrasound what is the cord position and in this situation we have to be extra careful it is better that we extend the monitoring for another 60 minutes that what is happening it is not the fetal sleep pattern and if there is persistent non reactive and repeated gaps in ctg sometimes it is we may omit ki fetal movement hua hoga that's why we are having gap but whenever there is a gap we should be a little careful about it so these patient should have the continuous ctg if we have this thing on admission ctg and if the patient is having another risk factor like hypertension iugr oligo we can have the low threshold of the cesarean section next next in next is uh, cg so this same patient what happened she was observed for 4 hours in labor she get uterine contraction but at 6 cm we found the thick meconium strain like a cesarean was done one minute apgar score was 5 and baby needed an icu care so this simple admission ctg actually gave rise to the alertness of all staff and we were particularly see that this was the meconium stain and could do the cesarean section or deliver the baby in time so this is the another admission ctg patient has come at the 40 week she is the post dated one and this is this ctg no pains it is just her edd one or two day cross so uh, what you say uh, shipra for this patient you want to wait for another four or five days or you want to get the patient admitted for this uh, for the induction of labor or what okay uh, so ma'am first of all we'll go by the checklist so the risk is only post dates and uh, then uh, uh, we see there are no contractions and uh, uh, she's not in labor and uh, um, baseline is you know you can't define a baseline there is a hyper variability there a yeah. uh, kind of a saltatory pattern which we discussed so i would uh, like to have a biophysical profile in this patient and see if how the liker is and uh, if the baby is doing well before i actually want to wait uh, for uh, this thing so only only this much will not help me i think i'll go ahead and do a 20 minute ctg more and see how it remains and if it still remains like that i will confirm by other parameters before i let her uh, go home and wait for her to go up to 41 weeks sanjay uh, aapka you have the, you are yeah, quite yeah. comfortable one, with it one, or yes one thing i want to add the thing is that seeing the ctg should i decide or we should decide the protocols basing on the clinical experience and clinical examination once you see that except post ctgin nothing else is a risk factor so to add it to it if the ctg does not opine to have a critical analysis on any absurd things you should wait at least then review the cases after 2 3 days 4 days 5 days 10 days post dated if it is carry some positive findings then only you proceed for to terminate the pregnancy otherwise wait and watch method is in so thank you very much for both the things actually what we want to draw the att attention of audience it is short with pattern which we like which we like that it is a good variability baseline it is almost 130 or ek mein jo bolte hain what i saw learn from dr arul kumaran it is basketball like ball you say you up and down up and down and suddenly one kick 
so this is supposed to be a very reactive fetus next slide please uh, so both the panelists have done a wonderful job uh, if there is no other high risk factor biophysical profile is okay and the liker is fine and patient is having good fetal movement with this ctg if the patient wants we can wait for two or three days for the spontaneous onset of labor because in post it there have been so many paper if we do early induction that result in more cesarean section and if your patient comes within 3 to 5 days of the post date pregnancy the chances of spontaneous vaginal delivery is much more so next arun next slide next slide so this is uh, another one ctg uh, which uh, the patient is in the labor room and uh, what do you see in the ctg we will have the review but what do you see uh, as a interpretation of the ctg where we can start doctor Anju has left or something. Otherwise, Mukta, you can take. What you see? You are happy with this CTG or not happy with this? Not at all. Not at all. Not happy. At all. Yes. <laughs> So uh, baseline do is one thirty, but there is total absence of variability, and variability is the most critical factor in a CTG because uh, there is loss of that sympathetic parasympathetic tug. So for me, this is an ominous sign, and this pregnancy should be terminated. as early as possible so It's thank you mr for for the, all the audience actually we cannot this is the beauty of ctg if we do the intermittent auscultation or we do the dopton every sister will say it is 130 or jiprani jaise ka hum log residency mein the or i feel so much of guilty that are patient ka fever ha theek tha aur raat mein kya hua iufd ho gaya because only ctg can differentiate this loss of beat to beat variability and it is a simple flat ctg so that's why we advocate as a professional yeah, exactly, having exactly. ctg should be the basic right of every laboring woman next slide please arun next slide so it was flat pressing we reviewed the patient she was iugr no sedation was given it was continued for next 90 minute there was no movement no change in variability C section was done at 2.1 kg deliver at Afgar score four. So the take take away is that for such such babies and for such mother we have to have the CTG and we have to detect in time. Don't let say कि हाँ उसमें तो आवाज आ रही है so it's okay. We have to have a look on it. Next next tracing we have this is the next tracing and the next tracing. I think two are the same. Next Arun next next tracing. No, no. Yes, uh, yes. Previous slide, previous slide. So this is one slide which is we I uh, like learned from Dr. Arul. It is the one fifty, a little tachycardia, and the uterine contraction and the loss of variability. So many times we can say that it is normal tracing. It can be a normal because we are seeing a little bit to bit variability. Next slide, please. Next, next. but there is no acceleration markedly reduced baseline variability and we are seeing a shallow deceleration again it requires a sharp observation and we have to have the history of bleeding absent fetal movement or choreomyelitis or the fever so this is very very important baby is again having the normal baseline so on dopton you are having the same good fetal heart rate but actually the baby is in the crisis so next next uh, next interpretation uh, so sanjay you can start from for this interpretation this is again tracing and what you say uh, in it it also seems quite normal but what is your interpretation for this ctg uh hello something i have written because it is already pasted so your comment on this ctg ready hello Ah, Sanjay, we can hear you. Yeah, there's the fetal monitoring you have to monitor, and all the time you find that is the bit to bit variation is here, or which we are. So there, you have to assess yourself whether to go or to. But so far the clinical judgment is here. You have to terminate as quick as possible. Yeah. This CTG, you will you wish to terminate why? Yeah, this CTG. This CTG. Yes. Yeah. You can see to this CTG, you know, Mukta. You can see to CTG. My slide. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Ma'am, variability yeah. is okay. There is a shallow early deacceleration. Yeah. If uh, yeah. lower yeah. line is uterine contraction, 
then there is a shallow early deacceleration otherwise variability is short term variability is okay long term variability is low so it's written that uh, fast is given three times but there is no response to fast yeah yes so uh, like it's not no acceleration is there even if three times yeah. time, that means uh, must be for 90 minutes there is no acceleration since 90 minutes because we have given fast for three times so brilliant uh, mukta you are rightly the gold medal awarding you could see the shallow deceleration which is yeah. a fine thing which is very very important there is no acceleration as well and the short term variability is quite okay next please so that is so uh, mukta has picked up everything so we reviewed the patient and uh, fast has been given there was no fetal response she was 34 week iugr normo tensive and has been on low dose aspirin now this is the thing that aspirin is we we today is giving every patient to the aspirin but it can also be not so benign drug the baby has the this wakes uh, ctg monitoring but came in night for tense abdomen for this patient also emergency c section was done and this patient was found actually we were not suspecting that this baby will have the that much of anemia because baby has the fetal hemorrhage baby hemoglobin was 4 abgar score 4 baby was pale so shifted to an icu and needed blood transfusion so actually baby is the new thing and when baby comes out then we know that how we are going to have and what drugs have been given and it can cause what so thank you very much mukta for this a uh, very good analysis you are close to artificial yeah. intelligence next arun next slide uh, so uh, shipra you take this uh, slide um, you must be uh, what you see uh, what type of so ma'am this is a uh... definitely late decelerations with the, and the, uh, the uh, this is a slow uh, the it is a, a slow response to the normal baseline is coming here so and it is quite it is lasting for more than 1 minute and it's quite uh, you know i need to uh, right yes it's a late deceleration mm -hmm. this i'll take up this patient for a c section you can you can just wait you see i like to see do the pv examination it's very important to examine yeah, the yeah, and then, the and then uh, definitely then take my decision as to uh, how to go further with this you can you can get ready for the cesarean section by the time you go for the clinical examination if it is the quicker time if possible to have a delivery then it's fine so if she is in our in uh, you know uh, she is in um, you can say late in labor you can even deliver a fast by a forceps application so we are have to deliver a fast yes we take into consideration everything if there are what risks are there and the variability is also reduced and uh, there are late deceleration so we need to uh, be quick in delivering this patient sadhna ma'am sadhna ma'am i hope i am right sadhna ma'am seems to have <laughs> hello i think we've lost connection some internet issues were there some ha uh, some internet issues Yes, Shipra, you have commented rightly. I think Dr. Sadna will be joining us soon. Sanjay, can you continue? She is joining in some time. So, what is the consensus on this? Okay. Yeah. Thank God, ma'am is back. <laughs> so, the actions which are advised by uh, Nice, uh, they have been followed. IV fluids have been given. and as shipra emphasized uh, rightly that we should yeah, never give 5% or 10% dextrose at this time we must give ringal ah, we to discuss with them right right change right. the position take it. take, take here it. i would like to say only not only left lateral we can make the patient sit up 
there is a there is a trouble in the internet connection that's why madam is not picking up okay let us proceed let us proceed yeah, arun yeah. please go to the next slide please yeah this is the next slide yeah uh can anjuman please hello so, uh, yeah yes. we can see very marked decelerations and they are both uh, late decelerations and yeah. Decelerations, as such, they are uh, they should be taken uh, cognizance of, and like in all cases, we need to evaluate the other clinical features. What are the risk factors, and what is the stage of labor? If yeah. the patient is in uh, second stage, we can just cut short the second stage, deliver her. If she is in first stage, we need to deliver her by a cesarean section if these uh, decelerations are persisting, which appears to be there because the two contractions we can see, they are both uh, accompanied by late. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, you see, there is a deep decelerations up to 70 beats per minute. Okay. So, and the baseline variability is very poor because it's a 26-year-old priming avida compensated with the mitral stenosis, IUGR, Fetal restriction by four weeks. So, madam has rightly pointed out we should go for emergency cesarean section. That's fine. Thank you, madam. Next. Yeah. Madam Sipra Kumari. Yes, sir. Can you please interpret this one? Sir, so, um, these are variable decelerations. And uh, they, there are uh, the variability too is reduced. Uh, and uh, we can say that there are no shoulders. And so it is a pathological CTG. And again, we need to re examine the patient. We need to check the vitals, give fluid, left laterals, check uh, if the patient is having hypertension. Uh, do a PV examination and in case uh, if this continues for more than uh, 60 minutes, we need to take her for a cesarean section. I think... Uh, no. The uh, number, you see the number of late dislations. How many late dislations are there? So there are two in the later half. Yes, two yeah. in the second part and, of the... Yeah. And the baseline tachycardia? Oh, I just missed. I think that I, that it's not visible. The I think the, yeah, don't see focus. this I this actually this is not visible. Uh, how much is oh, the yeah. Arun? Can you please help? One sixty, I guess. Baseline is one sixty. One sixty. Yes, you're correct. So baseline. Yeah. So uh, baseline is one sixty, and uh, there is number of late distillations. So what should you do? Definitely. So, uh, Definitely, we'll first we have to uh, uh, see exactly dif, uh, do our clinical examination, uh, yeah. go methodically, define risk, see uh, uh, see all those uh, if there are is any uh, the variability is reduced. I said, and of course there are late decelerations. Do uh, a conservative. Uh, uh, the conservative method first and then if still the patient uh, if these continue if these late decelerations continue we need to take her up as a cesarean section yeah thanks arun please next yeah this is a primary gravid of 39 weeks and emergency c section was done is that meconium strain liker and abgar score is 4 you have rightly taken the decision next slide please Yeah. Madam Mukta Kumari, Mukta Agrawal. Yeah, you can you can generally diagnose this one. Sir, baseline is 140, variability yeah. is okay. Yeah. We could see two dips. One is uh, late deacceleration, and this one is a variable. So yeah. I could interpret it's a variable uh, acceleration. So these are variable deacceleration. Yeah. 
so we can go for an extended ctg the pv examination the liker and the other risk factor exactly exactly the whole picture uh, only ctg is not the guiding force towards exactly. the exactly arun please arun please proceed if I'll, a patient I'll, I'll, yeah this is a second rabida at 40 weeks of gestation labor duration is 4 hours cervical dilatation 9 cm head at plus 2 close monitoring of fetal ctg and progress of labor we should go okay. left yeah, vital position iv fluids and we should try for normal delivery in this patient yeah 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 exactly thanks next slide please yeah madam you can tell anju madam please repetitive uh, late decelerations in this uh, like uh, my previous ctg though the contractions are not so good and we need to evaluate the patient probably she is in very early labor and uh, she will require a cesarean section but we need to do a better tracing because there is a lot of loss of contact also over here so we need to take out a repeat trace for a longer time and then reevaluate and chances are high that she'll require a cesarean section madam should we should we go for a clinical examination definitely clinical examination is mandatory in all cases ctg oh, alone yeah. 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 particularly in this case should we go for a clinical examination definitely Or you suspect something this type of variations usually happen when perhaps the head is compressed or hypertonic contraction or something like that but uh, uh, Yes. If written into good contraction, the contraction is very good. The uterine tone is uh, low. Yeah. Ma'am, so they are giving into. It is written in the slide that something unix into is going on. Arun, Arun please so next, go to the next slide. Writing. Yeah. The prime is full term. In advanced labor, oxytocin augmentation was done. Okay, but the contractions were not showing on the tracing. Yeah, yeah, they have tried it. Augmentation is not so. That is a slow progress. So changing of position, IV fluid, and the patient delivered within half an hour. Yeah. Next slide, please. I think there is no discussion in this. This is Aaron. <laughs> yeah. So long fetal bradycardia. <laughs> long fetal bradycardia. You can't wait. Yeah, you can't wait because you have to arrange for cesarean and the so many time you need. So that is the thing. We are hurried up because of these things. Sometimes you declare before the sometimes you declare before the patient and the attendants. Keep ready for cesarean section. By the time you discuss and uh, counsel the baby, <laughs> that is the whole pitiable condition in a case of obstetrician. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, Arun, yes. hello. Yes. There are no. I think this is. Uh, there are no contractions in this, and uh, there are spontaneous decelerations happening. This I can't see any contractions there. So part of the graph is not there. Yeah. So these. This has to be taken up. Uh, section uh, spontaneous decelerations without any contract uh, contractions is very very that to touching 60 beats per minute yes yes that to going up to 60 yeah. okay yeah this uh, this looks like a fetal anemia or something this is a uh, sinusoidal pattern which is occurring yeah. so we have to be very uh, you know careful with this fetus what to do section sir fetal anemia is there probably we need to check for this of course uh, every time we have to do the examination we have to see uh, the maternal condition as well and why this uh, pattern is coming and then take a decision probably this is fetal anemia and uh, we can evaluate the risk factors any 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 risk factors okay this is a post natal pregnancy uncomplicated postnatal pregnancy 
even tramadol you see the effect of drugs in labor yeah drugs drugs yeah. so there is yeah please please bring the slide yeah so there was intermittent sinusoidal pattern but patient delivered vaginally after 6 hours okay Arun, does time permits or should we go fast? I think we should go ahead. Uh, uh, I think we've discussed uh, uh, more situations. I think there's one more uh, presentation I, uh, from Arun also left. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we have finished this. Yeah, yeah. we're almost done with this. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Arun. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and I'll just uh, uh, present like how our device is actually important and what exactly we have developed. So basically, at Janitri, uh, so at Janitri, what we have developed is after considering all these challenges of uh, partograph, Robson classification, the cardiotopography challenges in terms of affordability, easy to use, and all, uh, we have actually developed this very uh, small, affordable, handheld based. Uh, fetal heart rate contraction and maternal heart rate device, which is just a simple patch which can be placed on the abdomen of a pregnant woman. And it shows you both numbers and graph. And you really don't need the bigger monitor, a printer and all. So that independent hardware can work. And this patch can go on the abdomen. Now, uh, considering the hospital's requirement, we have also integrated this with the bigger monitor and the thermal printer so that hospital can decide if they also want to go for this bigger monitor, which can comes into the different version uh, with the with the standalone uh, wall attached or the stand or with the bigger stand, which comes with the A4 printer and all. So we have make it so modular. So each and every kind of a hospital can afford to have this, you know. Uh, so on the mobile application side, uh, so we have this Daksh, which can generate you the automated partograph. You can fill all these partograph related information. It gives you the alert when to monitor which parameter for which patient. Then you can enter those parameter and it can automatically generate partograph for you. And uh, same for the option classification. You can enter all these parameters which are related to option. It will give you that option classification. It will store for you for that patient. Uh, like for the Abgar score, uh, so what you can actually fill all the Abgar score related thing and it will give you the ultimate Abgar score for that patient. Like that we have all the pre-delivery and post-delivery checklist for both uh, mother and newborn and uh, it can give you some sort of an alert based on those checklists. Like for, the, for the bigger hospital, we have made the centralized monitor where you know you can see all the CTG related data into one screen at one shot and what is happening, what's not happening. So it's a centralized monitor which we have developed. Yeah, so this is what something which we have developed and uh, after considering all these feedback, uh, we, are, we are implementing artificial intelligence on top of it for all, you know, to give some intelligent alerts based on the fetal heart rate contraction graph, based on the partograph graph. More than 30,000 patient has been monitored in 100 plus hospital across India. So this is what uh, uh, something which we have innovated in intrapartum phase and all the registered participant will also be getting our Daksh mobile application where they can use it for 500 patient. And it is a very, very, very intelligent mobile application which they can use during the intrapartum phase. So yeah, that is what we are working on. And uh, we are working the vision to see a world where no mother and baby die during pregnancy, delivery and post delivery. I think uh, Dr. Sadna is getting a problem in uh, joining, but uh, yeah. uh, I would like to thank you each and everyone for joining this uh, webinar. Very important as we all have to save the lives during the uh, perinatal intrapartum phase. And we at Janitri side uh, are completely focusing on 
providing you the innovation so which will be affordable so it can reach to the very remote level area and which should be very easy to use can be used by each and every one and uh, would like to thank you each and every one for this thank you for organizing this i also thank dr sadhana gupta and rajiv agrawal dr sipra kumar mari and mukta agrawal and above all mr arun because we are on the same platform giving message to the whole nation and everywhere let us enjoy it and uh, the doctors day is ahead i wish all a happy doctors day and uh, you work forward for the people especially for the neonatal outcome and the mothers thank you everybody thank, thank you so thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Arun, are there any questions because we had said we'll take up the questions after the panel yeah there are couple of question so if just um, very quick is up uh, it is already two of two and a half hours yeah i think it is but i think uh, people who have asked the question should be answered yeah yeah so very quickly uh, let me just go through these questions so uh, priyanka singh have asked uh, when to do nst how frequently fetal heart monitoring is in different phases of labor if anybody just quickly answer this uh, anju ma'am uh, can answer this first of all uh, dr priyanka i would just like to say that uh, nst is not done in labor in labor we are doing only ctg nst itself means that it is non stress the woman is not in labor and ctg that you have to individualize according to the patient's condition if she is high risk you may need to do it more frequently if she is low risk you can do an admission test and as and when required so that needs to be individualized in very high risk you may like to do a continuous ctg also uh, next question is from pv grishma in ctg which presentation is showing as a danger which need immediate action in ctg uh, you know you need to see the ctg as a whole you see the baseline is first you need to study the baseline how deep is the Uh, deceleration only one parameter we cannot define is actually an overall thing you need to see the patient and you need to uh, of course uh, see the ctg as well so not one one not one parameter can define that this is abnormal right okay. and uh, anshu narwal is asking is walking recommended during labor while using the ctg machine yes i don't think most uh, appropriate person to answer that <laughs> because your machine permits a uh, woman to amputate uh, during ctg yeah yeah so but uh, i think it if it that, that will help clinician mm -hmm. like how how does the walking help it definitely helps it improves the circulation to the fetus baruchi it is good if you walk and uh, last oh. question will take which is coming from mr arvind to develop any ai algorithm more data is required yes sir yes sir monitoring of fetal and maternal parameters of all the cases are required yes sir we can address this issue <laughs> ma'am we have enormous data in india it just need to be compiled so as i said it's a multidisciplinary collaboration and in make in india campaign we all should come together we have the database and you have the capability to develop a new software so i'm sure you can come with some good software which are ai based and will be very useful in future thank you thank you uh, i think uh, uh, we have addressed these question and uh, thank you each and every one and it is a long session two and a half hour almost and uh, we'll plan for more yeah. thank you dr sanjay thank you dr mukta dr shipra dr anju thank you everybody thank you everybody thank you all thank you sanjay sir yeah. anju ma'am dr shipra thank you all thank you all so much it has been a nice interactive session